Okay, I'm very happy and excited to be introducing our next speaker, second keynote speaker of this conference, Dr. Katrin Preller. Uh, Dr. Katrin Preller received her master's degree in neuropsychology and clinical psychology from the University of Constance, and then PhD in psychology and neuroscience from the University of Zurich, researching um, the neurobiological effects of several psychoactives. She was then a postdoc at UCL in London and Yale University, and she now heads the Pharmaconeuroimaging and Cognitive Emotional Processing Research Group, the Department of Psychiatry, Psychotherapy and Psychosomatics of the University of Zurich. Dr. Preller is the author of dozens of influential papers on the neurobiological and cognitive effects of psychedelics, including key publications on the effects of psychedelics on social cognition, the role of serotonin receptors in the effects of psychedelics, and on changes in brain connectivity induced by psychedelics. Today, she will talk to us about the neurobiology of psychedelics and their relevance for possible psychedelic-assisted treatment, a topic on which she is certainly one of the leading experts in the world. So I'm especially excited to uh, welcome her. Thank you for being with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Katrin Preller. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very nice introduction. And I'm really excited to be here today. I wish I could be there in person, but I can see at least on the screen that, you know, there are quite a few people attending in person. Um, I'm a bit jealous that I can't be there, but um, yeah, I hope we'll make it work anyway. And I'm excited to talk about the mechanisms of action of psychedelic substances today. So to get started, we know that psychedelics have a major impact on how we perceive the world, on how we perceive ourselves. And a lot of that is, of course, um, related to how these substances work in the brain. But we also know that they may have a pretty major um, clinical potential in psychiatric disorders. And of course, we always aim to provide the best psychedelic assisted therapy possible. And I personally think that understanding the neurobiology and understanding the mechanisms of action is key um, to, to achieve this goal. And during my talk, I will walk you through some of the results that we have gathered on the neurobiology of psychedelics and how I think this could impact the psychedelic assisted therapy that we provide in currently our clinical trials that we are conducting, but also in the future when um, these, these substances may become approved medication. So the two substances I've worked with the most um, in the last 10 years are psilocybin and LSD. And both have pretty similar subjective effects. However, they differ a little bit with regard to their receptor pharmacology. So psilocybin is a preferential serotonin 2A receptor um, and uh, serotonin 1A receptor agonist. LSD, on the other hand, stimulates a lot of serotonin as well as dopamine receptors. And now, what do these substances do? So what can we expect when we administer a psychedelic substance um, to our participants? Well, of course, these substances have been called hallucinogens, so there is a lot of alterations in visual processing going on. Um, what may happen, at least under the doses that we administer, is that if you see this picture of a wolf, um, it might happen that, that colors appear brighter, it might happen that colors change, things might get blurry, or what we see a lot is that um, things start moving where usually no movement is. So we're not talking about true hallucinations here. A again, at the doses we administer, which are usually in the moderate range, um, we're rather talking about illusions that people are perceiving. However, there's also a reason why we're not necessarily calling them hallucinogens anymore, because um, that term is a bit restrictive. So we know that um, we have these visual alterations, um, like vivid imagery here, but there's also a lot more going on, a lot more that is related to things like disembodiment or blissful states or experience of unity. So things that relate to self-perception. And we think that um, some of these effects may indeed be relevant for treating psychiatric uh, illnesses. So how do we get from the receptor stimulation um, to 
these alterations in perception and eventually to these clinically beneficial effects. And I will try to replace at least some of these question marks um, here and give you a little bit of an introduction of what we found. So when it comes to possible clinical mechanisms of action, there are quite a few hypotheses out there. And they range from very biological mechanisms like um, long-term changes in the serotonin to A receptor system to induced neuroplasticity, a result that we've mainly seen in animals so far still needs to be tested in humans. Changes in neuroinflammation, changes in epigenetics, alterations in brain networks, alterations in reward and emotion processing, um, some patients report insight into dysfunctional behavior and increased social connectedness. This is not at all a comprehensive list. This is just um, putting out a few of the major hypotheses out there, um, which, which have you know, an idea why these substances might be helpful for psych psychiatric patients. Now, of course, we could spend an hour talking about each and every one of these hypotheses. Um, we won't have the time today to do that. So I will focus on three key topics that um, I focused on in my work. And let's get started with, again, the brain. So as I said before, we have an idea that the serotonin to, uh, to a receptor is particularly important for, um, for the effects of psychedelics. Now, the serotonin to A receptor is an excitatory receptor. So once the psychedelic enters the brain, it increases the likelihood that our neurons will become active, will start firing in the brain. And of course, all our neurons are connected. So and that means that if some of them are more likely to fire, this will change how information is processed in the brain. And this will, of course, depend um, based on how many receptors, serotonin to A receptors, are located in a given brain area. We know that, um, we know that uh, the serotonin to A receptor is present in the whole brain, but in some areas there's more of it and in some other areas there's less. It will, of course, also depend on the dose that it is administered. And it will depend on the specific substance that we're using, because as I showed in the beginning, um, all of these uh, different substances have slightly different pharmacology. And of course, we, we, we think that there is a modulatory influence of these other receptors um, that these substances target as well. Now, if our cells in the brain, if our neurons fire differently, this will of course have an impact on how information is processed, how information is passed from one area to the next brain area. And if our brain, um, if our brain computes or integrates information differently, this will also have an impact on how our brain interacts with the body and the rest of the environment, because the brain in itself is obviously not an island. So it will have an impact on how we perceive the world. Now, in this talk, I will start with this first part here, talking about how psychedelics change the way that our brain is functionally wired. Um, and then in the last part, go on to how that may impact how we perceive the world and how we interact with the environment. So let's get started with um, just intrinsic brain connectivity. So um, just a quick reminder for in neuroanatomy. So we have two major systems in the brain. And one is um, the sensory system, so brain areas that receive input from our sensory systems, like the visual system here in the pink colors in the back of our brain, but also auditory, motor, and touch, of course. Um, so all the colored um, parts of the brain here are sensory brain regions. And then the other network in the brain is the association network, so the gray areas here. So these association brain regions are responsible for taking all this information that is received by our senses, by our sensory brain areas, 
and integrate them into a coherent picture and connecting it with um, past experiences and with future planning. So keep that picture in mind um, because you will see in just a second how this differentiation between these two networks becomes important for the effects of psychedelics. So when we started our series of studies trying to find out what these substances do in the brain, we first relied on, an, on a hypothesis that was put forward by Mark Gea and Franz Vollenweider, again, based on animal studies. And what um, they have seen in animals is that um, the thalamus, which is usually filtering the information that we receive from either within ourselves or our environment, is not working like it usually does. So um, what they said is that the filtering function of the thalamus, so this nucleus here in the middle of our brain, the filtering function is reduced leading to a sensory overload of information in the cortex, um, which is then causing the psychedelic symptoms that our participants are experiencing. So the first thing that we did is looking at the functional connectivity between the thalamus and the rest of the brain. And what you can see here is the result of this functional connectivity analysis. So we used the thalamus as a seat while our participants were under the influence of LSD in this case, um, and contrasted that image to when our participants were under the influence of a placebo. And what you can see here is, again, you see the warm colors, um, red and yellow here. Um, these indicate increased connectivity with the thalamus. And then you have these blue colors, and those indicate decreased connectivity with um, the thalamus. And if you remember the picture that I showed in the beginning, it becomes quite clear that the thalamus is uh, under the influence of LSD is more strongly connected to these uh, sensory brain regions in the brain, like the visual cortex here again in the back of our brain. But we have a problem with this specific method. And the problem is that functional connectivity is a correlational approach, meaning that it does not provide us any uh, information about the directionality of these effects. So basically what this means is that um, it's as likely that there is more information from the thalamus to the cortex, but it could also be the other way around, that there is um, more connectivity from these sensory brain areas to the thalamus. So to solve this specific issue, we had to use a second, a different method, which is called um, dynamic causal modeling. And this gives us an estimate about the directionality of these effects. Now, of course, all these methods come with a certain advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage here is that at least for the time being, we have to focus on specific regions of interest. We cannot look at the whole brain. People are working on that right now to be able to extend this method, to be able to look at the whole brain. But for the time being, we had to restrict our analysis to four regions, which are key regions in the thalamic filter model. And this is, of course, the thalamus, as before, and then the ventral striatum, the temporal cortex, and the posterior cingulate cortex. And then we, we looked at the directed connectivity. And as you can see here, we again see increases in connectivity from the thalamus to certain cortical brain regions, um, which are the blue arrows here under the influence of LSD. But we also do see increases in connectivity from the thalamus specifically to the posterior cingulate cortex here. Another prediction why we included the ventral striatum is that the model predicts that the ventral striatum is losing control over the thalamus, which is then causing um, increased connectivity to the cortex. And again, we see that indeed um, there's less connectivity from the ventral striatum to the thalamus. But of course, we didn't want to stop here. We also wanted to know what's going on in the rest of the cortex. 
And just a quick reminder again, um, this differentiation between sensory brain regions and association cortices. Um, and this is what we found when we looked at um, brain connectivity, a special measure of brain connectivity called global brain connectivity, which gives us um, the connectivity between each voxel, so each little part of the brain to the rest, the whole rest of the brain. And what you can see here is, again, a pretty similar picture as we've already seen with a thalamic brain connectivity. So for LSD as well as psilocybin, we see a synchronization of the sensory brain regions indicating increased sensory processing. And at the same time, we see a desynchronization of these associative brain regions. And the effect is very similar for LSD and psilocybin. Now, to summarize these effects, we have seen that um, the filtering function of the thalamus seems to be impaired under the influence of psychedelics, leading to increased, um, increased sensory connectivity. So probably more information is passed, more sensory information is passed onto sensory brain regions of the brain. At the same time, so at the same time, we have increased synchronization between these sensory brain regions leading to increased sensory processing, which on the other hand is not counterbalanced by integrity of our association brain regions, meaning that the way we integrate the sensory information is probably very different under the influence of a psychedelic. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it can probably explain why um, our participants are having these psychedelic effects because um, the information they are receiving from within themselves and um, from the rest of the world is brought together in a different way, potentially causing these visual illusions as well as other effects that we see. Why could this be important for um, our psychiatric patients? Well, if you are in a state where you're able to bring together information in a different way, this may also facilitate that you see the world in a different way and that you see yourself in a different way because you're combining information differently, you're um, connecting that with past experiences differently and um, potentially also with how you will target future um, problems differently. So it may help patients to break free from rigid thinking patterns and um, put them in a, in a state where they can look at their problems in a new way and work crea creatively on novel solutions. Now, we also looked into the time-dependent effects of, um, in this case, psilocybin to see, um, to basically give us an approximation of um, a dosing effect. So we put people in the scanner um, and looked at their brain connectivity 20 minutes after administration, 40 minutes after administration, and 70 minutes after administration. Um, and this is usually also the time when uh, first symptoms start to emerge until you reach the peak effects um, at around 70 minutes after administration. And what you can see here, especially when you focus on, on the right side, is that we do see first changes in brain connectivity emerging after 20 minutes. And here we see, um, here we see the occipital cortex, so a visual system showing the first significant changes in the brain. And this is very much aligned with um, what our participants report. So usually the first symptoms they notice is that the floor starts moving or the walls start moving. So the visual system is the one which reacts, the, uh, reacts first before a lot of other symptoms start showing up. So 40 minutes after administration, this, um, these changes in connectivity in the visual cortex get stronger. But there we also see that this disintegration of the um, association cortices is starting to emerge until you see the full-blown pattern 70 minutes after administration. 
But of course, when we are interested in uh, clinical effects, we have to take into account that, of course, we're not planning to uh, keep, uh, keep patients under the influence of a drug over a longer period of time. But rather, we are hoping that even just a single administration will have long lasting effects and um, help, uh, help symptom improvement over um, months, hopefully. So um, for this, for this um, effect to be clinically relevant, we basically need to see long lasting changes in brain connectivity. And this is a study done by colleagues at Johns Hopkins um, who showed that indeed there are changes in brain connectivity um, that last um, for um, at least a month after administration. However, as you can see here, these are not necessarily the same changes that we see um, when we look at the acute state, which in a way also makes sense because we don't want to keep people in a psychedelic state for a longer period of time. But it seems like something is going on after, um, after the administration of a psychedelic um, that lasts for a longer period of time. This is a study done in healthy participants. So of course, all of this needs to be reinvestigated and confirmed in, um, in clinical populations. And this is something that we're currently doing in our clinical trials, but they are not finished yet. So I, unfortunately, I can only show you the results of these healthy participants right now. Another very interesting thing that we've seen um, in our healthy participants is that we looked at um, brain connectivity at baseline. So the functional architecture of each individual's brain without any substance, and then looked at the magnitude of changes induced by psilocybin. And we've seen that there is a pretty strong correlation between how your brain is connected in its baseline state and how it reacts to, to psilocybin, which potentially could give us a marker of clinical efficacy already at baseline. Um, so potentially we have a stratifying biomarker um, if we scan people before we even administer any substance. Again, this is in healthy participants and it's a small sample size. So we cannot take for granted that this actually works. It has to be replicated in larger clinical trials, but it's a really good starting point um, to see, you know, to find out to, or for us to know where we need to look at if we want to find out who may profit from this uh, treatment and who not. So I want to bring this part full circle and coming back to the receptor pharmacology. So in our LSD trial, and you remember LSD is this pretty promiscuous substance where um, it targets very serotonin as well as dopamine receptors. In this trial, we also um, administered a second substance, which is called catanserin. And catanserin is fairly selective for the serotonin to A receptor, but in a different way than LSD meaning that it's an antagonist, so it's blocking the serotonin to A receptor. So when we administer catanserin first, it blocks the serotonin to A receptor, then we administer LSD. So LSD can um, target all the other receptors that it has affinity to, but it will not reach the serotonin to A receptor anymore. And what you can see here is that when we compare the connectivity patterns between LSD and placebo and LSD versus catanserin plus LSD, you basically see exactly the same picture. And of course, I could also show you catanserin plus LSD directly versus placebo, but it's a very, very boring um, picture because it's, it's literally just a gray brain. So when we administer catanserin first and block the serotonin to A receptor, LSD does not have any effects on brain connectivity anymore. So that serotonin to A receptor um, seems to be absolutely necessary for LSD to be effective. Um, we also saw that when we just asked questions about, uh, about the subjective experience of our participants. And here again, um, our participants were not able to distinguish 
um, placebo from cat enzyme plus LSD. So serotonin to A receptor, definitely important for LSD to induce effects on a neuronal as well as on a subjective level. And we also um, checked with another method um, to really make sure that the serotonin to A receptor is as important as we expect it to be. And what we did here is we used cortical gene expression maps derived from the, from the Allen Human Brain Atlas, um, which shows us the spatial distribution of the serotonin to A receptor. And we correlated this with these changes in functional connectivity that we've observed under the influence of LSD. And as you can see, there is indeed strong alignment between this pattern that is induced by LSD and um, the distribution of the serotonin to A receptor. Okay, now what does all of this mean for psychedelic assisted therapy? So can we learn anything from that for psychedelic assisted therapy? Um, and I think, yeah, we can, because if, um, if, it is, if, if the mechanism of action here really is that information is brought together in a different way, um, and that supports um, breaking free from rigid thinking patterns, that um, also means that the therapist can probably actively support finding these new perspectives if we have this window of opportunity where the participant's brain is more open to finding creative solutions. However, of course, these interpretations come also with a lot of questions. And one question is, what is the best timing or dose to leverage this breakdown of rigid thinking patterns? So we have seen that already um, in, at 40 minutes after administration, we see this disintegration of um, associative brain regions. So does that mean that maybe even a lower dose is already enough for this to be effective? And the other question is, of course, the timing. So when we administer a medium to high dose, people will probably not be able to talk too much about their experience and um, will not be able to engage in actively finding new perspectives. So um, we have to find out what the best timing is to leverage this effect. It also asks the question, well, should we then interfere with the acute experience? Should the therapist during the experience actively guide our patients to finding new perspectives? So far, most of the therapy is based on you know, just directing the attention inwards. So the patient is lying there, um, is listening to music, is wearing eye shades if they want to. But maybe this points to a more active role of the therapist even during the acute experience. It poses the question whether acute experience or long-term effects are more important. Um, we've seen there are changes in connectivity going on, but maybe this acute experience is um, the important part, which then leads to long-term changes. That is certainly something we need to find out in the future. But we might have a stratifying factor for individuals, as I showed in the beginning. Again, something that we need to test in clinical trials. Now, the second part of my talk is about, well, if the brain now is processing information differently, um, how does that interact with um, the environment? And there we've also run quite a few studies. And one result that we have seen repeatedly is that under the influence of psilocybin, which are the blue bars here, um, participants uh, process negative information less than under the influence of placebo. And again, this is a study done with cat anzerin, so this effect is blocked um, when we block the serotonin to A receptor. So less processing of negative information. We've also done something similar in the scanner. This is, um, here it's behavioral data, here it's scanning data. And we see that the amygdala, so the emotional center of our brain, is less reactive to negative stimuli, to negative input. Um, well, more recently, 
uh, there's also increased uh, increased interest in microdosing. So the more or less chronic use of a psychedelic, but in a very low subthreshold dose. Um, we have seen that there is very little effect of a microdose, at least in healthy participants when it comes to behavior. Um, but we have seen that there is a change in the connectivity between the amygdala and um, certain brain areas. Um, it's, not a, it's not a super strong effect, but there are significant changes in amygdala connectivity under a single low dose of uh, LSD. And particularly the one um, in the frontal brain region was interesting because the connectivity between the amygdala and these frontal brain areas correlated with changes in positive mood. So that might mean, again, the amygdala is implicated in changes in emotional processing that maybe even if healthy participants do not necessarily benefit from this low dose of LSD, that maybe people who have um, problems with emotion regulation may benefit from this low dose. But again, this is healthy participants. So it's something that needs to be tested in a clinical population. But again, the question, um, well, what does that mean in terms of long-term effects? And this is again a study run in um, at Johns Hopkins University where they looked at um, the long-term effect of a single dose of um, psilocybin on amygdala reactivity. And as you can see here, one week after the administration, we have this decreased amygdala reactivity that we also see um, during the acute phase of the effects. And then one month after psilocybin, this effect returns, um, the amygdala reactivity returns back to normal, uh, back to what, uh, what it was before the administration. But there seems to be a window where amygdala reactivity is reduced and that extends over the um, acute effects for at least one week. But there's also um, a conflicting result um, presented by uh, the research group at um, Imperial College London. And this study was done in, um, in depressed individuals. And there they show that amygdala reactivity was increased to all emotions um, the morning after psilocybin administration. But um, this, this scan has been done before there has been any integration work. So it seems like the morning after the administration, people are in a highly emotional state and maybe only uh, integration therapy will then basically calm this down and, um, and give us the window of opportunity where negative information can be processed. So um, looking at these data again, we see that we have reduced processing of negative information, reduced um, reactivity of the amygdala um, acutely as well as post-acutely. Um, and this may open a window of opportunity for processing negative life events that are usually very hard for participants to, to target, to process because of their um, strong emotional effects. And with reduced amygdala reactivity, we might have the opportunity to therapeutically process these negative life events. But again, at this point, we have more questions than answers. So, um, the timing, again, is very important. When can or should patients be confronted with negative life events after administration? Is it acutely? Is it post-acutely? I mean, we've seen this window for at least one week. Maybe it's longer. Um, we don't really know quite yet when the best um, timing is to um, process negative life events. We've also seen this um, increased reactivity the morning after administration. So that points to the importance of integration therapy to achieve long-term improvements. But it also asks the questions, well, if we have participants in a very vulnerable state the next morning, or at least in a very emotional state the next morning, 
do we need to provide additional support during these post-acute effects? And again, long-term effects in clinical populations are still unclear. And this brings me to uh, the last part of the talk. Um, of course, one very important, um, important um, environmental factor is social is the social environment. So we were interested in whether psychedelics also change how we interact with our social environment. And I mean, we've already known that um, psychedelics change the way we interact with negative stimuli. But what does that mean for negative social interaction? We know that, um, that psychiatric patients um, suffer a lot from social rejection. Um, we also know that some patients like depressed um, patients or borderline personality uh, patients react more strongly to social rejection. Um, so what does that mean for uh, when we administer a psychedelic? And here we used a, a standard paradigm that has been replicated um, over and over in the literature, which is called Cyberball. So our participant meets Michael and Sarah um, before he's administered any substance. And then we administer psilocybin or placebo. We put our participant in the scanner and in the scanner, they are, uh, they are playing a, a ball throwing game with Michael and Sarah. And what happens is that after a while, Michael and Sarah will just stop throwing the ball to our participant and exclude them from the game. And the beauty of this, um, in a way, rather simple paradigm is that it has a pretty strong effect. So almost everyone coming out of the scanner is like, oh my God, that was actually really, really mean. And um, the other beauty of this paradigm is that it consistently activates um, the anterior single led cortex um, when our participants are excluded from the game. Um, so this, this increased activity of the anterior cingulate cortex has therefore also been called the social pain signal. And this social pain signal is increased in patient populations um, like borderline personality disorder patients. So what happens under the influence of psilocybin? Well, first of all, of course, we asked our participants and we asked them quite a lot of questions also to make sure that you know, they, were, they, were, um, they did realize that they were being excluded from the game. And yes, they did. So we asked them to, to guess how many, um, how many throws they had received and none of these control measures showed any change from placebo. So they were perfectly aware that they were being excluded from this game. But when it comes to how, ex uh, how excluded did you feel, so the emotional response to this exclusion, this was significantly reduced under the influence of psilocybin. And also when we look at um, the brain, the fMRI data, we see that the social uh, pain signal in the anterior single led cortex was um, reduced after administration of psilocybin. We also uh, looked at other domains of social cognition and one is empathy. And here we saw that um, psychedelics or psilocybin in this case, um, increase emotional empathy. So this result has been replicated by now um, under the influence of LSD and has been replicated um, quite a few times. So there seems to be a consistent effect that um, psychedelics acutely increase emotional empathy. So feeling with another person. We did not find any effect on cognitive empathy. So cognitive empathy means um, identifying of other people's emotions. Um, and we did not find any changes of moral decision-making, at least acutely. It is of course possible that um, these are just not things that we can change acutely. So these may be um, social domains that just take longer to be changed. Um, but um, that is something that we need to find out in the future. At least acutely, we do not see an effect on moral decision-making or cognitive empathy. But again, um, especially in the case of cognitive empathy, where we're also relieved 
to at least not see any decrease in cognitive empathy because that might have been an indication that people were just not doing the task correctly anymore. But um, that was not true. So people were doing the task, they were able to complete the task, which also gives us confidence that this increase in emotional empathy is a true effect. And the last task that I want to present today is a task on social influence processing. So we looked at whether people are more suggestible to the, in, to the um, opinions of others. And what you see here is that um, under placebo, our participants tend to change their opinion more strongly when there is a high conflict between their own opinion and the group opinion. And LSD basically reverses this pattern. So you see more alignment, more change in your own opinion when there is low conflict um, than when there is a high conflict. So this increased suggestibility under the influence of psychedelics that has been um, reported previously um, seems to be true in general. But um, it seems to be very specific to, um, to other opinions that are not too far away from the participants' own opinions. And this is also reflected in uh, MRI data where we see that the medial prefrontal cortex plays a key role when it comes to social influence processing. So again, what are the implications for uh, psychedelic-assisted therapy? So I just showed a few uh, social effects of these substances. Um, there are more studies out there, um, and uh, we've written a review paper trying to summarize um, all of them. Um, so basically, there is a big impact on how psychedelics change how we perceive our social environment, potentially, again, opening a window of opportunity for patients to reconnect with their social environment. But um, again, questions over questions, the, do these effects have implications for the therapist-patient relationship? Um, we've seen that people are less prone to um, rejection uh, sensitivity, so they're, they're less reactive to social rejection, which could basically give them um, more confidence to open to the therapist and share um, with the therapist. Um, but we've also seen that they are more suggestible, at least to similar opinions. So this could, of course, change the therapist-patient dynamics. We could also speculate about group sessions. Well, if we have these social effects, maybe group therapy may have an additional beneficial effect. And it opens the question whether we should include family members or loved ones in the therapeutic process, because we know that, um, that um, psychiatric patients feel isolated. Um, and if we have this window of opportunity, we might um, want to support this reconnection by including family members in the therapeutic process. But again, we need additional data, we need clinical data, and we need um, long-term data here. So to sum up, we've seen that psychedelic assisted therapy is an interaction between pharmacological and non-pharmacological mechanisms because psychedelics change information processing in the brain and the brain interacts with the environment. The therapist can probably support finding new perspectives that may be helpful for patients. We may have an opportunity for processing negative life events that are just too stressful to um, process in, in without this substance. We may have an opportunity for reconnecting with the social environment. We might even have stratifying um, biomarkers for therapeutic, uh, for therapeutic efficacy. But of course, there are still a lot of questions, and I think we should take these questions seriously. We should try to, to answer them um, to reach this goal that we all share to provide patients with the best psychedelic assisted therapy possible. And with that, I want to thank everyone involved in these studies. And of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine, for this um, really 
a fascinating overview of research that you and others have done uh, in this area, and especially for how the, all this then relates to possible psychedelic assisted treatment. We do have quite a bit of time for questions. We have some questions immediately from, from the live audience. We can start with that maybe. Thank you, Katrin. That was like really uh, profound but accessible, which is really a difficult combination. Uh, I uh, I think uh, I thought I asked you because you are the expert. Uh, Peter said Peter Schoestet, uh yesterday during his keynote, he referred to Professor David Nutt, which you who you probably know who has uh, multiple times thrown this idea that modern brain science proves Huxley right. This reducing well idea. And uh, you were talking about this like thalamic filtering and so on. But, uh, I would like to hear your general opinion about this not troll. Modern brain science proves Huxley right. What could this mean? Thank you so much for this question. Um, but you will need to um, you, you will need to give oh, me yeah. a bit more detail so, on how sorry, exactly. Sorry, they... Catherine, you, I was muted. Just mute, oh, mute for a second, please. Could you start over? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Super. Um, yeah. So um, maybe before I answer this question, um, maybe you can let me know how exactly David thinks um, that modern brain science proves. Uh, at all exactly right. That's exactly the problem because no one knows what he means. Uh, Peter said that they are writing something together on this, but uh, my opinion uh, is that uh, it can mean two different things. Uh, Huxley's idea is based on this uh, long tradition of perennial uh, philosophy and this emanation theory from Buddhism and um, uh, William James' uh, transmissive theory of consciousness, so this philosophical tradition, uh, which is metaphysical and difficult to see how it bears on uh, empirical neuroscience. Okay. But then we have uh, uh, the neuroscientific idea of increased informational entropy or connectivity, uh, which I think might be something what not means here uh, that... Um, well, usually the idea, usually the idea in Huxley is that um, I try to somehow summarize that when you reduce brain activity, you increase consciousness. So it's like that the brain somehow reduces the mind at large. This is Huxley's terminology. But the idea is that when you decrease brain activity, you increase consciousness. Is there any grounds for this? Um. So the very short answer would be um, no. <laughs> um, no, I don't think that at least um, my data and maybe David has access to other data. Um, but no, I don't think that we can um, we can just from from the data we have at hand right now, we can conclude anything about the level of consciousness and even in terms of level of consciousness um, there are controversies if we can even speak about higher states of consciousness so if you for example read what I think is a really interesting article by Olivia Carter um, and I think she what what she shows is um, pretty convincingly shows is that of course psychedelics will improve function on on certain domains and will open up windows of opportunities in certain domains but at the same time at least under the acute influence um there are certain things that you cannot or at least should not do like driving a car right so um so some of the domains of consciousness may be enhanced while others are decreased and um I, and, and therefore, it's probably very difficult to speak of a higher state of consciousness. So for me, um, I would define it as an altered state of consciousness. It's definitely not your regular processing. It's definitely altered. And some of these aspects may be beneficial for, um, for, for healthy participants as well as for clinical populations. But I have not seen any data out there so far 
that um, that conclusive, conclusively demonstrate that psychedelics induce a higher state of consciousness. But, you know, maybe these data will be collected in the future. But so far, I don't think that we are in a place where we can claim this based on the neuroimaging data we have out there right now. Thank you. Um, a question that comes to my mind when you mentioned uh, possible differences in baseline connectivity as biomarkers for how uh, psilocybin or psychedelics might work better for some people. Is there anything you can say about this qualitatively? How are these people different? Like if the connectivity is different, what, what, what does that mean? Yeah, and um, that's a very interesting question. So um, basically uh, we, have, we have taken a very broad approach here. So we've again looked at um, changes in these very broad networks um, of, um, of uh, sensory brain regions and, um, and, and associative brain regions. And, um, and it seems like the way or, or whether we find hyper or hyper connectivity already in a baseline state is related to the changes induced by a psychedelic. Um, that is probably in, not the granularity that we need to really be able to answer your question, where it's like, what is it exactly that is different in these brains? Because we're really looking at very broad networks. Um, but we will definitely try to look into that and give you a more comprehensive answer sometime soon. But for these things, um, we just need larger sample sizes. So all of our studies are conducted with around 25 participants, which actually makes them the biggest um, sample sizes in psychedelic research. But still, we need to live with the limitations that come with that. And for these mostly correlational analysis, especially when we're looking at, you know, many, many voxels in the brain, um, we need larger sample sizes to really tease apart um, which brain regions do what and contribute to this effect. Thank you. Question from the live audience. Okay, hi, uh, Dr. Preller. Thank you very much for the very good presentation. I'm a first year psychology student and I have a question about the uh, reduced activity of the amygdala after uh, psilocybin and you presented results that uh, one week after the psilocybin the uh, amygdala activity, acti activity was reduced but there was also some conflicting results uh, one day after the psilocybin administration and you said that uh, you uh, speculated that the reason might be due to the integrating therapy which was not given yet uh, at the conflicting results. And I was wondering what makes you think that uh, it would be the in in integrating therapy and not the seven day period that would cause this conflicting result. And um, an additional question that does the integrating therapy alone with placebo cause reduced activity of the amygdala? These are all wonderful questions. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, you're, you're absolutely right. We, right now, we don't know. We can just speculate, but that's exactly the reason why we need more research in this area to really track um, you know, the, the changes that we see over time. So first of all, um, we, I'm, I'm not aware of any studies um, where we just see reduced amygdala reactivity with the therapy, but there might be some out there. Um, we know that amygdala reactivity is also reduced after, um, after longer use of, um, of, of SSRIs, so antidepressant treatment. Um, but yeah, whether, it's, whether, it's, uh, whether we also find this effect just by, you know, just in the placebo condition, just um, with the therapy alone, is a question that we will be able to answer, hopefully sometime soon, our depression trial where we test this is um, we, we collected the last patient data um, a week ago. So um, if we talk again in about half a year, we'll probably know the result to your question. Um, when it comes to um, the conflicting results, um, you're absolutely right. It might not be the integration therapy. It might just be um, a timing effect. However, you also need to take into account that um, the results um, where they showed increased amygdala reactivity the morning after is in depressed individuals, whereas um, the long-term effects are in healthy participants. So there is 
um, it is plausible that especially depressed patients are in a very emotional state after the acute experience. And for them, it, it, it seems plausible that we need, you know, we need to integrate this information or this, this experience um, to make sense of this heightened emotional state and to um, make sense of the experience itself, because it seems like something is happening on an emotional basis after the experience. Um, that's why I think we need to be aware of that and, um, and we need to provide support um, the day after. Um, in, in what exactly that is, whether that is integration therapy or another kind of support, that's an empirical question. Um, but right now, it could, of course, also just be possible that, you know, they, it, it just returns um, to, to either baseline or even that we see these beneficial effects without any therapy, but it has not, it just has not been tested yet. Thank you. I'll take a question from the remote audience. I'm um, summarizing this a little bit. Ika Ulikun is asking about uh, whether um, the changes in the brain's information processing differ between psilocybin and LSD. And he's wondering whether um, some uh, differences uh, in, let's say, in the change processing of the environment could explain uh, subjective differences in subjective effects, such as the fact that uh, people often um, may often report some kind of presence in relation to psilocybin or mushroom experiences, but generally don't do this under LSD? Yeah, a very good question. Um, so to, to answer the first part first, um, so we have by now indeed um, compared psilocybin and LSD directly. Um, that paper is not published yet. So again, I have to ask for a little bit of patience, but um, it will hopefully be submitted sometime very soon. Um, and there we don't see any significant differences um, when we compare these two substances directly in terms of brain connectivity or the specific measure of brain connectivity that we have used on the doses the, that we um, administered. Um, but then, of course, you know, that doesn't mean that um, psilocybin and LSD are exactly the same thing, right? So we also know that, for example, duration um, of the effects is very different, which probably also has a psychological component. It probably makes a difference whether you're in the state for four hours, five hours, or whether you're in the state for 12 hours, right? So um, yeah, there, there definitely are differences between, between all these substances. And as I said, some of them may relate to receptor pharmacology um, and the moderating effect of the other receptors that um, psychedelics or that the specific substance targets. Um, how much this accounts for things like the presence of entities that some people report, especially under the influence of DMT, um, is, is something that we just don't know quite yet. Right, thank you. One more question from the live audience. Mm, yeah, thanks for the informative and clear presentation. I have actually two questions. Uh, first one is about the uh, neurodiversity and differences in how people respond to psychedelics. And I'm interested, have you found like clear kind of subgroups in the patterns of response, how people react, or it's, uh, yeah, kind of seems that there is lots of differences between people and it would be interesting to hear. Yeah, yes. have you observed this in, in the neural patterns? Uh, and then second question related to the, this uh, theme of suggestibility and that people uh, start to more conform to like uh, opinions that are in low conflict and less to those that are in high conflict. And I, I uh, ask, have you thought about the like cultural implication this has or interpretation that I got was that this might like connect to that people are more prone to form like strong like in, in group bonds and maybe have more like a uh, kind of gap to the out group and maybe foster kind of going into some kind of subcultural echo chamber or something like this. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, uh, 
maybe I'll start with, you know, your, your second question, because I think, yeah, this is exactly the conclusion we, uh, we can probably draw from this data, or at least, you know, um, this may be an explanation why we do see forming of, um, of, of subgroups um, with um, a lot of, you know, in-group synchronicity um, in, in the psychedelic field, right? However, um, this may this uh, what we see may explain this, but we have not. Um, I don't have any um, empirical evidence that this is indeed the case. But it absolutely strongly points into the direction that um, that of your interpretation. The reason why I didn't necessarily present it that way is because um, it points into this direction but there's no em empirical proof, right? So we would actually have to look at this phenomenon in not just a single patient, but actually look at, at groups of participants, but that has not been done so far in this, in this research. But yes, you're absolutely right. It may have implications um, on a more sociological level. Um, to your first question, well, all we know right now is um, that there seem to be certain personality traits that predict how you react to, um, to psychedelics, especially the personality trait absorption has been strongly correlated with a positive um, experience under the influence of a psychedelic. Um, but that is more or less the only um, the only result we have there so far. And again, the reason for that is because if we want to investigate inter-individual heterogeneity, we just need very, very large data sets. And we we unfortunately don't don't have them at least yet. Thank you, Catherine. We have a lot of wonderful questions here, but unfortunately we are out of time. But I would like to ask um, Catherine, if you might have any final words, especially for um, people here in the audience who might be students or researchers who don't yet study psychedelics, but are planning or interested in studying psychedelics, is it a good idea to go into research on psychedelics and why or why not? What do you think? Yeah, well, I think it's a wonderful idea. We, I mean, we need more um, people in this field who are asking exactly these questions that you've just been asking, who think deeply about the effects and think deeply about the social implications and think deeply about the neurobiological mechanisms. So, yes, um, absolutely. Um, Go, go for it, right? But also be aware that um, it still is a somewhat um, controversial field, even though it, it has a lot of attention right now. Um, we need to be very scientific about these substances. We need to be careful in how we interpret our results and that we're not selling them as just magic bullets, but we need to acknowledge that there's a lot that we just don't know quite yet. Um, but um, I think approaching them with a scientific mind and um, collecting the data and answering these questions that you all had, and I unfortunately had so, so a few answers, um, that, will act, that will be exactly the way to bring us forward in that field.